So thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first remote meeting of the Arlington School Committee. Um, as a preliminary matter, I have um, some things to read written by the town council. Uh, thanks to uh, Doug Heim for putting all this together for us. Um, I'm Len Carden, chair of the Arlington School Committee. Uh, please permit me to confirm that all members and persons in anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. That is a requirement of the uh, open meeting law modification for remote meeting. So let me go through the list. Um, Mr. Hayner. Present. Ms. Morgan. Present. Dr. Allison Ampey. Present. Ms. Seuss. Yep. Hi, present. Mr. Schlickman. Mr. Schlickman, you're muted, sorry. <laughs> present, present, present. Great. Mr. Thielman. Present. And uh, staff members, uh, Dr. Bodie. Present. Dr. McNeil. Present. Mr. Mason. Present. Mr. Spiegel. Present. Ms. Elmer. Present. And Ms. Fitzgerald, you would hear earlier. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, this open meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth, due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely, entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless public participation is required by law. Uh, we, it's not required by law, but we, will, we do allow public participation uh, by our policy, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, for this meeting, the Arlington School Committee is convening by video conference via Zoom, as posted on the town website, identifying how the public may join, and we're also being broadcast uh, by ACMI. Uh, please note that this meeting is being recorded, and some attendees are participating by video conference. Uh, accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All of the materials for this meeting uh, are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard, and uh, the public can follow along uh, through the town website. So now some ground rules. Um, we are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Uh, before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our, of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. Uh, I, as the chair, will introduce each speaker on the agenda. Uh, for each agenda item or sub-item, I will go down the line of members uh, of the committee in inviting each by name to provide comment, questions, or motions. Uh, please hold until your name is called. Uh, further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Uh, and, and as I said, uh, if there's some urgent need to, um, uh, to be recognized, please either uh, raise your hand in, uh, in, in Zoom or uh, wave at me, uh, or if necessary, just uh, unmute and interrupt. Uh, and uh, hopefully we will uh, have a, have a well-run meeting uh, uh, following these rules. Uh, so for um, the first item in the agenda, before I, I want to open the meeting first by acknowledging that the very stark circumstances facing the world, our country, and our community, I want to thank all the doctors, nurses, 
healthcare professionals, all the fire, police, EMS, and other first responders, and all of the essential employees in our grocery stores, pharmacies, and other essential providers for all that they are doing at this time. I also wanna thank our district teachers, administrators, administrators, custodians, and support staff for all of their efforts as well. Our first item on the agenda is public participation. Um, because of the remote nature of this meeting, we did request that comments be emailed in advance. But uh, Karen, unless you've received any uh, in the last uh, few minutes, I don't believe we've received any, is that correct? That's correct. I okay. Yeah. Um, but because this is our first meeting this way, and uh, in case people did not uh, see that item, I, I will uh, see if there's anyone wanting to speak uh, now. So if you would like to speak, we do allow up to three minutes for a total of 20 minutes for public participation. Uh, if there's anybody who would want to speak, um, please go off mute and um, take turns stating your name and I'll make a list. Is there anyone for public participation? All right. All right, great. Thanks. So the, um, the first item is, uh, Hello. sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Neil and I'm a parent of a, of a student. Um, is this the right time to participate? Uh, sure. So uh, let me just check if there's anybody else besides Neil. This, is, this will be your last chance. Anyone else besides Neil? Uh, this is Lynette Martin. I raised my hand. I don't know if you're using the Oh, yeah, hand. sorry. Okay, yeah. So Lynette and Neil. Great. All right. So Neil, why don't you go ahead first? Um, and again, three minutes and uh, uh, start when you'd like. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're dealing with a, a very serious situation and it's unprecedented. Um, I have a daughter who goes to Gibbs and uh, we see the enrichment material on the website, um, but I was wondering in terms of using Zoom, uh, if that's possible for the teachers just to do review material or go over enrichment material. Um, you know, we're using it now, I'm using it, I'm working from home, I use it for my work meetings. Uh, I think that will help with a sense of security for the students to see their teachers and um, interact if possible. Uh, and just for a short time, maybe 20 minutes for each core class. Um, and I think that will help maintain uh, a schedule. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to mention that. Thank you. Great, thank you. And, and I'm sorry, can you just give us your full name for the minutes, Neil? Yes, Neil Saunders. Neil Saunders, great, thank you. All right, and the next one is Lynette Martin. Go ahead. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Hi, uh, Lynette Martin. I was wondering if we'll be sending out a technology survey like I've seen done in some surrounding communities such as Somerville. I wanna make sure that, um, you know, I know that there was an offer for Chromebooks, which was great. But I feel like a lot of the turnaround for this stuff has been quick and I'm just wondering what supports our families need and want to make sure that everybody has access to the enrichment materials. Um, I know that there are some uh, asylee families in Arlington that have very limited access to email only on cell phones and stuff and um, I'm wondering what we're doing to communicate with and reach out to these families. That's all. Thanks for everything. I'm sure you guys are going through right now and doing so also just appreciation thank you great all right thank you all thank you both and so the first item on our agenda is of course the uh, COVID-19 update um, we have a few sub items that we had asked uh, Dr. Bodhi to be ready to address uh, the first one being meal distribution but Dr. Bodhi if you want to give an overall update or however you want to handle it please go ahead Uh, but you're on mute, sorry. Dr. Bodhi, you're on mute. Okay, got it. Uh, well, thank you. And uh, thank you for the appreciations of all of you uh, to the people who are out there, uh, you know, 
working on our behalf and also thanking the administrators and teachers. It has been an unprecedented time, as we all know. Um, it's a time when we're all sort of struggling to manage all of the different things that are in our lives, including this is the, the, the kinds of meetings that we're doing um, remotely. Uh, and all of the communication often take a lot more time than we were, we're used to having, having people together. Um, where did, uh, let me begin with talking about uh, just sort of an overall view of where we are philosophically and then get into a lot of the nitty gritty questions that people have had. And I've had parents email me also with questions, which I will hopefully be able to address, including um, our two speakers this evening. Uh, this has been unprecedented. Um, and one of the things that I, the commissioner has said and we have said is that there, it's not really possible to replicate what goes on in schools every day. Um, the, the, the connection between teachers and students, the supports that are offered to our students, uh, the connections, um, the, the school lunches and breakfasts we offer. While some of this has been able to be replicated in some respects, it is not that we are in school in a remote learning environment. Um, there have been a lot of conversation, both in the media and in, in, in emails about whether schools should be um, trying to do that, trying to do a replication uh, in having schedules for students. The, there are 12 districts um, that have been in, in very close communication over the last couple of weeks. And this, this week we put out a joint statement talking about our philosophy uh, around school closure with an emphasis on trying to maintain the connections between student and teacher, which is very special and important to students, uh, as well as uh, looking at how we can um, promote and continue remote learning. Now, I think one of the things that has been a little bit confusing uh, is the term remote learning. What does that mean? Uh, today, the commissioner uh, 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 gave out the, the Department of Education's uh, recommendations for how to support student learning uh, and holistic needs. And the one thing that they emphasize in this document is that we're not going to replicate and that remote learning should be looked at from a variety of ways. Some things that, that, are, that teachers uh, uh, have students connect to in terms of, of learning activities, things that the students pursue on their own, um, reading, of course, physical activity, there's a, there's a range of things that the Department of Education is encouraging districts to, to do to promote remote learning. That, that's not the same thing as continuing in classes the way we have been before, advancing the curriculum. And I think that one of the underlying principles of this uh, is the issue of equity. And Ms. Martin alluded to that in her um, comments that we have a, a lot of uh, families who um, are not able to equally access uh, all the materials that we have, um, we have available. Uh, they um, do not have the technology at home to do that and something that we have been addressing, which I will, I will speak to. But remote learning is a, is a, from the point of view of the Department of Education, can, even in today's um, document and the view of all of these districts that have been um, working together is that what we need to do right now is to promote deeper learning and practice of concepts that have already been learned. And there's certainly much that can be done there as well as provide enrichment exercises so that students can continue their learning and um, uh, be able at the end of this time that we are in closure to be able to come back into um, a regular uh, school setting as we've had. Now, that's where we are right now. I, you know, the governor has now had schools closed until May 1st. We will be returning on May 4th. That's where we are today. And we are planning as a district to meet our students' needs um, during this period of, of closure. 
So I, I will talk to a number of the, um, the questions that have been asked, but let me, let me start with um, the issue of equity and what we're doing for students who cannot uh, necessarily access. We have been, we have uh, put a uh, technology distribution plan in place. We went very quickly last weekend so that we would be able to uh, be able to push these computers out for people as, as fast as possible. We had over 400 people sign up to get a computer um, for some technical reasons. Some people did not get some follow-up information as to where to go. We had about 60 people that did not pick up a computer. We are going to have another distribution and uh, certainly the people who have already uh, signed the loaner agreement will be able to get a computer. We're, we're probably looking at next Wednesday, though that's not hard and fast at the moment. Uh, and as well as people who still need um, some devices at home in order for students to be able to, um, to access different resources. So that will be happening and another, another uh, invitation will be sent out to all parents again tomorrow. Now, to the point is some parents um, may only, may have issues with understanding. Uh, we've tried to do some translation uh, for parents. We've done, we've done reach out. Our office has called a number of parents to make sure that they are getting um, emails and if they understood what was, um, uh, what was being said in the emails. I know that different principals have been reaching out and calling families as well. And that kind of outreach will continue as we go forward. The, so we do know that, for example, at the elementary level, we have only really one parent who does not have email access. And we've already talked with that family. But that's not a good indicator of whether they have adequate um, internet or access to devices. So this outreach will continue uh, so that we can maximize it for, um, for, for families. But then there's other issues too with equity. Some students in our schools, and when they have um, any kind of a learning activity, get a lot of support uh, from teachers, uh, from teaching assistants. And that type of support is not as readily, in fact, it's very difficult to provide online though I can tell you a little bit more about that in my uh, presentation. But uh, there are also uh, children that are living where parents are working at home and it's very difficult for them to, to, to be able to say at, at 1030, we're going to be on a particular call. In fact, teachers that have been doing this are reporting probably half or less of the class um, is able to come on to those, uh, those conversations. So what we have been looking at is having much more asynchronistic types of outreach in, in, um, in um, involving students. Meaning by that is that if we, we were to put a, um, a resource up or a video up, we want it to be able to be accessed at any point in the day, not at a specific time. Um, let me address the issue of um, the, what's the other one? The issue of, of the the Zoom meetings. I will have to say there has been um, a continuum of outreach by teachers. There have been some teachers who have been doing a lot of outreach, and there's been teachers that have not been doing a lot of outreach. In fact, I've had a couple of parents say, I haven't heard from my teacher. And so we have, we span that range. And as now we've finished these two weeks that we've had, which, which came on very quickly, um, we recognize that. And we were, over the last week, we've been working on providing resources uh, for parents, um, making sure we have uh, lunches for our students that need them, making sure that we get computers distributed um, certainly encouraging that outreach we put on our on our website uh, mental health uh, links and resources we have um, created an, uh, uh, an FAQ frequently asked questions for parents 
we have reached out to parents who have emailed us that they can't, once they got the computer, they didn't know how to log on to the computer. We've provided those instructions. We've talked um, directly with some of those, some of those families. So there's been a lot that's been going on. Now, as we end this two weeks, we are looking at next week and being much more explicit about outreach, about um, contact with students and, uh, the, and assignments with students for students. So th this, and this, uh, this has been supported by the teachers union. They very much want to also um, have teachers remain in good, in good relationships and with, uh, with their students. In fact, if I was to hear say that I heard anything more this last two weeks is concern always expressed by teachers, administrators, um, and other support people about the welfare of our students. So I, I do want people to know that, that this is really on everyone's mind and trying to, ad to adapt to an environment that I think none of us expected was going to be like this. And we're all trying very hard to um, support each other, to care for each other, and to make sure that um, our students continue in learning and uh, continue to feel supported. So hard to um, support each other, to care for each other, and to make sure that um, our students continue in learning and uh, continue to feel supported. So next week, uh, there will be some changes. I will be writing parents tomorrow about some of the things that they can expect. And um, one, of course, is going to be that there's going to be explicit that teachers can reach out and should reach out. And there's going to be a variety of ways that that can happen. Um, our first speaker tonight mentioned Gibbs and the Zoom meetings that have been going on. There have been Zoom meetings going on throughout the whole district. And one of the things that um, our, our IT department is concerned about are a lot of the privacy issues around Zoom that we are going to be addressing. So for the moment, we're not going to continue Zoom, but we, but we do have Google Hangout, which is very similar to Zoom, which is part of our Google Suite. And while we're not mandating that teachers use uh, the Google handout, a Hangout, uh, it is certainly a tool that they can use. But what we are doing is that we are, we are doing some crash courses for teachers who do not use Google Classroom as a, as a, um, a way that they communicate with students, that that is going to be expected of all teachers in teaching students in grades three to 12. We've already had a lot of teachers sign up for professional development today, and there will be some tomorrow and then on Monday. It's a much more common tool that you see at the secondary level, but not as well used at the um, elementary level. So what parents can expect from that is that um, we will be reaching out to let them know that uh, what Google Classroom is, how to access it, and students in those grades from grades three to 12 all have a spy ponder email. Our students pre-K to two do not. They have a way to um, uh, get onto the system, but they do not have a, an email account. So students access the um, Google Classroom through their email address. It is something that's very common throughout using, as I said, in Gibbs, the uh, Audison, and, and certainly the high school. So the other kind of feedback I've had from parents is that all the resources you put on the website are just overwhelming. I don't know what, ac what activity to pull for my second grader or for my uh, eighth grader. What, what math review exercises should I be doing? And the intention of this is a, is a resource that is not chronological in terms of concept taught. Um, you know, in terms of differentiating instruction, there may be some students that need uh, a particular skill reinforced and others a, a different one. So the, the whole panoply of resources are there and available. 
but we hear what parents are saying. Is they're not educators, they're not sure what to do. So one of the things that will happen next week is that um, teachers will be suggesting particular activities by their grade, by their discipline, and asking students to do some learning ac activities that they will, um, the products of which they would upload and teachers would get feedback on. So I think you're gonna see next week a, a lot more direction in terms of the resources that are available. It's also possible that teams of teachers at a grade level um, or in a discipline at some a shared course will also potentially create some uh, content, again, that's enrichment or focused on deepening the learning of already taught skills. We are not advancing the curriculum at this point. I'm not saying that that may not happen down the road, but that's not where we are at the moment, nor is it where the Department of Education is suggesting districts uh, adhere to. All right. Um, let me go get your notes here of the different things you want me to address. The, um, one of the things you wanted to know was about the supply. Do we have enough computers, the Chromebooks to distribute? The answer is yes. Um, the Chromebooks that have been distributed were, um, were clean before they were distributed. And they were also, people were given a, um, a uh, charging cord for them as well. But I think, I don't know, some people opened it and just didn't know how to get on. So all of the, I think that is, it's been cleared up at this point, though I suspect with more distribution, there are going to still be more technology questions, and we will put some more FAQs about that. There are some right now um, on, the, uh, on the district enrichment website. When I first started, I was talking about uh, the issue of equitability for students that, that often need supports as part of being able to learn in school. One of the things that we're going to be doing more of is, it already is on the website, is having more collaboration about when an assignment goes out, that any accommodations that might be appropriate or we could give um, online, we will do. If you go on the district enrichment site right now, you will see that certain um, suggested activities will be accompanied by some kind of uh, an accommodation, such as a graphic organizer. To the extent that we can, we will uh, provide as much support as, as we possibly can. Another question had to do with, um, uh, well, the outreach to parents. Are we going to need to buy more, more Chromebooks? Well, we have, we have um, the answer, the short answer to that is yes. We're going to buy more Chromebooks because Capital Planning Committee is allocating money for next year, and we we have a, a cycle that we that we go through in terms of upgrading uh, computers. Right now, um, we are still giving a Chromebook to the students in grades K to two. We debated whether we would give iPads out. We are doing that for preschool, but um, we're, parents of students in in K to two are going to help to help them get on. But we thought that the, the power of the, um, the Chromebook would be preferable to what we could give students in the way of an iPad. And uh, so we've decided to make that adjustment. But I, I will be perfectly honest and say that our K2 students have had very little experience with that and will need some support. Um, we will revisit this if we find that parents are finding this is challenging for them. Um, but and as in all of these things, we're, it's a fluid situation. We're, some things change by the hour, certainly by the day, as we move forward and we learn from things and try to improve upon what we're we've been doing. So let me see if there's. I think those are the main points that I wanted to. Uh, say right now, but I will also say that um, for parents, there there is an FAQ on the website. Um, and we are happy if you send questions, we're, we're always trying to update that. And uh, 
And you can even tell when you open it, it'll say it's updated a particular day and you'll know what the new material is. So let me just open it now because I'm sure there's probably a lot of questions, some things I may not have uh, addressed that you'd like to hear more about. And I will unmute. All right, great. Thank you for all that. Um, as I said, we'll go through the order we sort of normally do at the table. So starting, um, I also I wanted to mention that um, Mr. Levy from the AEA had notified me that he was not going to be able to participate tonight. Um, so he is not on. Um, but Mr. Hayner, you, you're, you're up first. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bodie, could you, uh, I don't know if it's possible, could you address the, uh, you made a statement about problems with either security or privacy with regard to Zoom. Uh, can you talk about that or is that something that you can't talk oh, about? Well, just a little bit. I mean, uh, what I can say is this, um, what we have done this year is enter into um, individual contracts with any of our apps. So any apps that we offer, we know that the, the student's data is protected. Now, Zoom has a, will not sign that, but they have, they have on their um, website where you can sort of um, agree to their privacy agreement. So we are looking into that. Under federal law, students under age 13, um, parents must get permission to go on, on some of these um, different apps. But if a district agrees to it, then that we do it in absentia of parents. So a long answer, but we want to look into this. We want to I'm not saying that we're not going to do, use Zoom uh, going forward, but right now we do have this uh, Google Hangout as part of our suite, and um, there's pros and cons to both of them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Allison Anthony. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Bodie, for that update. You've addressed some of the questions that I had, um, but I've got a few more. Um, first, what is the need for Chromeback, Chromebooks versus what we have? And how sure are we of what the actual need is? Because I'm concerned about how many, the email and the response time had very limited windows. And I'm not sure we've, I'm not sure we've heard from everyone who actually needs something. Um, I agree. I don't think we have heard from everybody, despite outreach. Um, we're going to widen that window a little bit. We'll be putting it out tomorrow and probably close it on um, Monday night sometime. We, we found from this experience of this week, we really do need a day to, to ramp up. Uh, we, we were racing to get everything done. People worked last Sunday uh, to make sure that they were ready to go. We also want to decide whether we're going to have a few locations or multiple locations. So there's a lot of decisions will be made on Tuesday and then we'll tell everybody where to go. But to your point, I think with underlying is, do we know we're going to even with this second distribution um, reach everybody? We know we're, we're working individual families to see if what we can do. Uh, some, some on Monday were, hand, were delivered to families they couldn't even come out. And so we, we're, we're trying to do that. And I know that the high school has plans to do some, um, for, for some people who, who are quarantined, they can't leave, are gonna make sure that um, we, we able to provide them with some kind of devices, which will, by the way, be very clean when we get them back. Um, but what is the need for Chromebooks Chromebooks versus what we have. Oh, how many we have? Hmm, we have plenty. We have almost a one-to-one -one environment in all schools, but we just don't let students take them home. I think that's something that we might think about in the future. In some schools, it's the, it's more iPads, which was what um, Stratton and Thompson primarily. But in the last few years, because of MCAS, we have been purchasing more Chromebooks for grades three to, to 10, actually even beyond that, they have to do a retest so that we have enough computers that we don't, we're not moving computers between grades in order to do MCAS. So we have been 
investing heavily in the last few years. So we do have enough. Uh, that's, my concern is really more about how do we reach everybody who needs it? Okay. And that's um, our concern. That's good to know. The first, I don't remember if it was a school committee email or if it was a parent email, but it said something about 400 Chromebooks to distribute and that didn't seem like it was gonna go very far. Um, but that I'm glad to know that we have enough and I'm glad that we're working on more distributions. Um, to that point, I'd suggest, I think there, although parents may have access to email, some parents may have access via work, via community mm -hmm. Wi-Fi, you right. know, things that are not working well right now. Um, and I wonder if we would want to consider a robocall. Um, and maybe not just to address this, but in conjunction with um, as you move into the next phase of what we're doing it for remote learning. Um, yep. Um, in fact, we, we were debriefing about this. I did do a robocall last Sunday morning um, to all parents. And apparently, I heard later that I never got your call because I heard yeah. that staff people or parents. And IT went and looked to see what happened. And apparently, it hit one caller and the whole system went off. Hmm. So some people got the robocall and some didn't. I'm going to do another robocall this time around as well, probably as a reminder, you know, I, I'm not, not going to say a Sunday night or Monday morning or something to remind people about this. But yeah, there was a, and I don't, they don't even know what happened. It set up as the system and it hit somebody's phone and then left. It just, broke down. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I was one of the ones who didn't get a robocall. So mm -hmm. um, then another thing that I noticed as the Chromebooks were distributed, um, you mentioned about the issues with, log with logins and stuff, but if there can be both something supplied about how to get tech support, because the elementary school parents are just, I mean, a lot of them haven't, or some of them at least, haven't ever seen a Chromebook before. And so they get this home and they have to log in and they don't have their logins and they don't, and their kids don't have an email. And it was, people are already anxious and this just made them more anxious. And, and I know that there's ways of dealing with it, but the parents were, you know, it, it's, let's try and make it easier for them if we can. I, to I totally agree with you. We're tr we're trying very hard to do that, um, and some parents were actually called and walked through it, and others, you know, we we sent instructions. I'm just double checking, but I'm pretty sure we have it on the the enrichment activity section. Mr. Dr. McNeil is on this. He, he probably he's one of the architects of it. Um, yes, it's it's on it's there. there. If you go on to the uh... Uh, online resources. Uh, I added it today uh, with okay. the information. It's one of the updates. If you go on under online resources for parents, it will it'll see where it says uh, uh, spy ponder account information. Yep, it's right. It's literally right in the first. This is all done by date. So it's, it's in the March 26th update. Okay, I'm not, yeah, I think it, it sounds like you're doing work on this already, but I, I agree that things need to be a little bit more organized, um, but, you know, I know that's under a work in progress, so I think let's wait and see how that goes. Um, I had two other quick suggestions. First, I think it would be really helpful to have an overall email that addresses to parents, which addresses the things that you just told us today, kind of the approach, the timing, the timeline to expect information from, you know, when should you be expecting contacts from parents, when sh or from teachers, mm -hmm. what's, you know, what's the ramp up going to look like? Yep. Um, are, yep. That's a great, and in fact, that's what we are working on. That's going to go out tomorrow and, and um, a sort of an overall statement to parents and then linking the back in to uh, you know, some of the 
the information here. But no, I, I we totally agree that the parents need to have some in expectation because we need their help too on this um, because some many students know to go on to their, their Google Classroom, but this is going to be somewhat new for elementary. And what we're going to have to do, and that is, is really quite it varies throughout the district. It's going to be very new, but it's a great tool. And we're so when we go out, we're going to have to have parents help in terms of getting the students to you know to go to their to that. Um, uh, and we'll we'll give directions as well as we educate everybody and how the kids elementary students can access Google Classroom. Okay. And then the other one is a suggestion that as the teachers go forward. Um, thinking of enrichment activities and such first if there's any need for volunteers and I don't mean in person but you know either people who need if they need help finding resources or if they find resources that are useful if there's a place that we could be sending them um, and second that as teachers are working on things if they could plan activities that involve the community for example there's been some um, Around here, someone organized a shamrock hunt. Everyone who heard about it put a, a shamrock in their window. And then as kids would take their daily walk, um, they tried to see how many shamrocks they could find. And it makes, things are really strange right now. And it gives them yeah. some interest and, and something to do. And you know, there's ways of, if you had people just post a letter in the, ask community members to post a letter in their window, Kids can go around, they can, you know, kids can use it for math, they can count them, they can um, do, the older ones can do graphs, you know, there, there's a lot of ways, or they can try and, the younger ones can try and see the whole alphabet, you know, it, it's, there's different ways of doing some things over time that uh, are, they're help, you know, it, it's both educational and also um, kind of involves both the community and the kids. It helps them be a very observant as they're yeah, that too. around. Mm -hmm. That too. Right. Okay. That's all. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hello. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Smith, you're next. Okay. Hi. Um, so, you know, I, I do want to acknowledge that it, the district has done a lot with some very difficult circumstances and um, something that we couldn't have predicted, obviously, um, months ago. Um, I have gotten a lot of questions from parents, as I'm sure you have, about things that other districts are doing, that other states are doing. Um, and I guess I'm still, and I know it's still being worked out, but I'm still not clear what how things are gonna look different um, so the new recommendation is that there be some sort of meaningful and productive learning for approximately half the length of the regular school day. So I think one thing that parents have found frustrating is that they feel like they're just getting links. And I think that raises real equity issues because some parents are able to take those links and be robust with them and come up with a curriculum on their own and other parents aren't. So just, just to sort of I'd just be curious to know how this is going to look more teacher, more district, more curriculum leader driven type of instruction rather than parents sort of meddling around. You know, not just, oh, go to these links and now look at page three and four, but something that's much more robust is I think um, what parents are looking for and what the new recommendations. I also note that the new recommendations do say that in some cases at the high school level, you could introduce new new curriculum. Are you saying that you're not doing it, even though that's sort of allowed at this point? And I think um, the parents who expressed concern to me are on things like math, where it's really um, sequential. And so, if you sort of don't finish a certain amount of algebra this year, you sort of don't have the skills that you need for the next year for or for algebra two. And so, I just want to know: Are there any plans to? change the recommendation to do some new material at the high school level in the middle and maybe the upper middle school level as is now being allowed allowed by the new recommendations 
the, the Department of Education is, from my understanding and the districts that we have had the strength statement is that they are not suggesting advancing the curriculum because of equity issues for students. Now, there are some, there are, we have a call tomorrow with the commissioner and we'll learn a little bit more about that. Um, I'm not saying that this is not how we're going to evolve. At the moment, that's not what we're doing. There's a lot of material that can be done, uh, looked at, and, and, and not everything is a link on that, on the, on the district uh, enrichment. In fact, a lot of the stuff can be printed. And I will say that last week, we spent a, a huge amount of time getting packets for anybody who asked us for one of, of paper, you know, hard copies of a lot of these activities. Each one of those packets was an inch or so thick and we mailed them to people. We, we mailed close to 400, I think over 400 of these uh, paper packets, which is something that other districts honestly have not done. Um, so yes, we're, we're very conscious of the issue of equity and be, and will all students at the high school that are in an algebra class be able to be on, uh, continue their learning without the kind of supports that they may have or be on be able to see a video. We are probably moving in that direction of creating videos that teach that is asynchronistic so that you went into Google Classroom, you could see a, a teacher, you know, just you know talking about something, uh, some concept, um, could be reviewing in more depth uh, some lessons in math that they've already had. So we really are going to be encouraging videos that the students can can look at. I think that that is a very valuable way to do it, rather than just we don't. You also see in the um, the DESE regulations, they're really trying to discourage screen time too. They don't want kids sitting in front of a computer for hours and hours every day. That's not the intent of remote learning. But yes, we may be. We're we're all trying to adapt to our circumstances right now. And um, I can tell you that that's not what's going on in the districts that uh, had that joint statement right now. We are, we are looking very carefully at what might happen should we actually have closure longer. I think that is a, an important issue that we're going to have to address. But for right now, this, we're, we're approaching it the way I described. So uh, j just um, what I think would be helpful to the community is to get is for uh, parents to get a sense of what the next few weeks will look like and how that differs from what we've seen so far. You know, as facts on the grounds change, as the recommendations have changed, I mean, the new recommendations are that there should be meaningful and productive learning for approximately half the school day. So that that's just going to look very different. I see. I just think mm -hmm. it'd be helpful to get a real clear picture to parents. You know, this is what we've done so far. This is, you know, we've, it, it's taken extraordinary effort and it's been great and people really came together. Um, but now that things have changed on the ground, here's what we're going to do and, and just make it very clear. How does that look? How does it differ from what we've seen so far? And again, I do want to sort of emphasize that there are equity issues when it isn't like directed by educators, um, the learning isn't directed by educators because then leaving parents to sort of go through materials and figure out how to craft instruction on that or something some parents can do better than others. And so that, there's real equity issues about that. That's true. Um, there, are, there are many equity issues trying to address all of these issues in a fair, um, thoughtful way is, is really what we are working toward. We have, we're constantly talking about this and what we're going to do. We've had, we have meetings that are going on at all levels of the school district planning. So we, we're very conscious of this issue. And, um, we, and yes, we're going to have a, an, um, a letter out to parents as to what to expect differently next week. Okay, thank you. Um, and there'll be opportunity for more questions for the round if, we need, if, we, if needed. Um, just, I just want to interject, though, um, Dr. Bodhi, so that the 
the new guidelines just came out at noon today. So there, it may actually be a two, prob probably will be a two-step process, right? So whatever you were planning for next week, you were already planning on and probably already had that email to parents written. But mm -hmm. what the, what Desi is suggesting and doctors with, with, with Ms. Seuss mentioned, the half day of learning, the mm -hmm. possible advancement of the high school curriculum, uh, the direction by the teachers, maybe something that you still need to work on and roll out the following week, right? Roll out what the following week? The, we're not doing advanced. What's, required, what's, what's suggested by Desi? I mean, what you're, what you're rolling out next week doesn't match up 100% with what Desi is recommending. Uh, in what aspect do you say, do you not see that being the case? Uh, are you requiring teachers to plan a half day of learning for each student? They are, we just got this, re, this information. The idea is to give students activities and things that they can do and have student choice. The encouragement is definitely to have that amount of time. And we'll be very explicit about that. Now, is any one assignment going to be, you know, three hours in the day? No, the, the ideas that the commissioner has pointed out were things where the kids actually do some exercise too, um, that they they do walks. It's there's having expand the horizons on what constitutes learning is something that's very much a part of this document. But I hear what you're saying. It, it, our te teachers are prepared to next week make sure that they are giving some um, assignments out that. They will, they will give feedback on. They're not going to grade the assignment, but they will give feedback on them. Okay, thanks. I'll save my other comments for my turn. Um, uh, Mr. Thielman, you're next. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Uh, and um, uh, I, you, Lynn <laughs> took the questions that I had, uh, but uh, <clears throat> I wanna echo what everyone else has said. This is an extraordinary situation and uh, I don't think any district uh, can, or in, can, can be prepared for something like this. It's, um, so I, my kudos to those in the district who are working very hard to try to continue engagement between teachers and students, which is actually the most important thing, I think, at this time. <clears throat> my questions are these. First of all, um, has the district, or have you, Dr. Bodie, given some thought to, um, the question was alluded to earlier, what will happen uh, or how we will make up 30 plus uh, lost academic days. Uh, so for example, let's just say you have a student in uh, Algebra 1 uh, in the eighth grade at the Addison Middle School and that student uh, hopes to either, uh, you know, hopes to do geometry next year. Um, how you know, how are you going to make up those, those lost days? Or let's say, you know, whatever, whatever class it is. Um, I'm just wondering to what extent, if you, you know, this is new, maybe you haven't thought about, I mean, it's probably, you probably may have people working on it, but maybe just talk a little bit about the, the work that's being done and the thinking that's taking place on, on that kind of an issue. How do you make up lost work? Well, it's a great question and something that we have been thinking about. What, what will happen when we come back May 4th if, we're, if we haven't um, um, gone forward with the curriculum that would be part of an Algebra 1? One of the things that we're going to have to do, and we've already been talking about it, is creating um, some teams of people to look at what are the essential things that still need to be taught uh, for that course in the, in the balance of the year. Um, I, think, I think almost many students, not all students, benefit by deepening the knowledge of what they've already learned so that they're able to learn newer concepts in a, in a faster and a deeper way. So no, we have been looking at it. I don't have a quick answer for you on what we're gonna do exactly. There's been uncertainty as to really when we're gonna come back. We now know it's May 4th and we'll be planning accordingly to, to that, but it does, we do wonder whether we're going to be looking at looking at further further closures. We don't know, and I think that's the uncertainty of all of this. But meanwhile, you have to plan, 
and the what if, if this happens, what are we gonna do? If that happens, what are we gonna do? And, and that's the kind of where we are right now. I will say though, the last two weeks, we've been just trying to run quickly to deal with all of the other things that we need to do in terms of getting, getting resources out there. Um, I've had districts tell me they've actually been happy because they've been able to take some of them and help, and that's great. Um, getting food, getting packets out. We just, it's just been um, quite a big effort, but I do think we're gonna have to um, look at this and, and be planful. And you're, you're right, you're absolutely correct. Those are exactly the kind of things we're thinking about too. Yeah, and I, I realize the past two weeks have been crazy and there's, there hasn't been a lot of time to think about it. So I'm not assuming you've, you've, you've figured this out, but I'm glad to hear that you're, you're um, <clears throat> uh, thinking about it. Um, uh, so, I mean, it's, it's clear to me from all the recommendation, from all of the guidance from the commissioner um, that uh, we cannot advance the curriculum. It's also clear um, that we're not going to be grading uh, work for credit. Um, but, you know, what happens if you get into a situation in which, you know, a, a student is not doing um, his or her work, not handing anything in? Uh, what are the, you know, what are the ramifications and, and how do you even how do you even enforce that? I, I'm just wondering how you approach that. You, you're getting the, the tough questions we're trying to deal with too. In fact, I um, had several conversations about that uh, with some um, members of the AEA today. What what will we do if we have students that are not responding, not turning in any work to get feedback? Um, I think what we what we will do is we will out you know, do an outreach to parents, but there's gonna be a limitation to what we can do about that. And we're not going to be, none of this work is graded. So that some, some students respond to the leverage of a grade. That's not on the table right now, but what is on the table is down the road, whether we're gonna get credit or no credit too. So that's a little bit more of a lever at the, at the high school. Um, we're, not, we're not there yet because we're not giving we're, I'm not saying we're not going to be there, but we're not there at the moment. No, you're absolutely right. What do we do? The students, it's not like you can, they're sitting in front of you and you can do an intervention. Um, we don't have a, a good answer for that other than we will continue to reach out to parents and to the students. And um, <clears throat> will you, um, you know, will you be able to, uh, accommodate every every individual education plan um, in this kind of environment where where student work won't be graded but it will be or won't be uh, uh, accepted for credit but it will be reviewed by teachers I mean we'll, we'll are you confident that every IEP can be accommodated during this time no not at all and, and in fact that's one thing that's been Clear from the Department of Education, we're not in school, and so therefore we are not going to be providing um, or responsible for providing all of the accommodation, everything that's in a student IEP. Are we going to try to do some support? Absolutely, uh, we've all been trying to do that, but no, there's this is not this is not a replication. Now, what will happen is we'll be. Certainly, when we return, we'll be looking at uh, teams will be convening to take a look at IEPs to see, you know, what what where we go from there. But no, and in fact, when we talk to other districts, this is exactly the the issue that everybody is struggling with. How do we support some students and some that are going to be it's going to be very challenging to do that? I'm I'm assuming that the district has data. On or the name, you know, names confidentially. I'm, uh, obviously, the names in, uh, of every student um, who doesn't have internet access or, or access to technology. At least, at the you know, the elementary school teachers would know that for sure. Um, but I guess my question is, do you have that data for all the students? How large is that number, and what's the strategy for making sure they get access? Well. I'm not sure our, our data is entirely accurate in terms of um, who has it or not, because an email address isn't um, isn't synonymous right. with having internet 
Um, we have people who, and I know this from talking with some of the principals that they know of people who really don't have it, but are not responding to outreach on this issue. We are trying to find that out. That is exactly what we're trying to find out to make sure that they do. Now, we sent out, but again, they have to be able to understand it and, and how we get it translated for them to know how to get internet service. A lot of the providers right now are um, giving free access to internet. But on the other hand, you've got to get somebody to your house. I mean, there's a lot of technical things that have go on in order to say that you're going to have internet. Um, but we, it's, it, it's, it's one that we don't have a totally accurate picture on. We have a good picture on it, but, but do I think that there's people we don't know? Yes, I do. Okay. And this is my last question, Mr. Chairman. And I'll, uh, I know I've taken up a lot of time. Have you, um, have you and Michael and, uh, started an analysis of any impact this shutdown or suspension of uh, on-site learning uh, will have on our budget favorably or unfavorably have you have you have you started to think about that at all or is not even oh yeah oh yeah you have oh, yes. um, can you share your thinking with the team we're uh, we're in a very fortunate position that we are going to be fine we're keeping track of all of our expenses that were due directly to uh, the coronavirus. But, um, you know, as you know, from our budget discussions before, we, we were projecting a, uh, a surplus that was going to be put into special education. We also have some uh, revolving accounts that will be very helpful. But of course, one of the issues that we're also facing and is that we're discussing is what do we do about fees? Because a lot of our um, programs and people who uh, take after school, community education, uh, music lessons, there's a whole, there's a lot of services we provide that are based on fees, daycare, preschool that are the gen ed students. So what are we going to do about the fees for those programs during time of closure? I, I don't have an answer for you tonight, but thinking about it. And then what is the impact on the, you know, the um, monies that we have to support those programs and people? One thing we've made a, a commitment to as a district is that we are continuing to pay everyone, including all of our hourly uh, people, everybody, even, even long-term subs that we had had just hired and we're beginning to do the work, we're, we're covering everyone as we go forward. And fortunately, because we had a projected surplus, I, I think we'll be fine, but we'll, we'll be able to tell you more as we move forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure, thank you. Good questions. All right, Ms. Morgan, you're up. The cool headset. I think Mr. Schlickman is actually before me. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Paul. Yes, that's right. I'm forgetting the table order. Mr. Schlickman, you're next. But you're on mute, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Bill, say hello to Bonnie. And uh, so let, let me, uh, you've gone through most of the uh, questions in terms of connectivity uh, and, and the actual technical use of the uh, Chromebooks at home. Uh, have we found cases where folks don't have internet access and we've been able to make connections through one of the providers? I don't think I know the answer to that question, if we have or not. I think the only way we're going to find out is the personal contact with people. And um, I do know that uh, some, some contacts like that is, is definitely happening to find out. It is so, it's very important for us to figure out who needs this because they're just simply not going to be able to access, you know, any of these resources or teachers other than through email. And we can certainly upload videos to email, mm -hmm. but watching it on a phone isn't the most desirable way to do it. Yeah, if we're getting the Chromebooks out, 
uh, I know there are a couple of providers who are offering low cost uh, connectivity for low income families and and I hope uh, we're able to make connections so that they're availed of that. Um, By the way, we we did look into buying hotspots, mm -hmm. and they didn't have any. Oh, okay. They, they had gone. They're just wiped out. Mm -hmm. So now maybe they're getting more, um, because we would we would be willing to get those and put them with a Chromebook if we could get them. Oh, okay. Um, on the uh, challenge for users when they're getting the Chromebooks and as far as signing into Google Classroom. Uh, I've often found that having a cheat sheet with screenshots working people through the process is is an important thing to tuck into the packet along with that. Uh, mm -hmm. The things that we really, I guess, are going to have trouble connecting to and figuring out. Uh, I hope everybody is doing well, our teachers are doing well, our students are doing well. Um, uh, but even if you're healthy through this, uh, there's a lot of stress in, involved mm -hmm. in the social isolation. Uh, and I'm wondering how we're working maybe with our social workers or uh, through other supports for people who might need some extra support through this particularly if we have any teachers who live alone. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about the teachers or the students? The teachers? Uh, actually both. I mean, we, we, mm -hmm. we, we, we're responsible for both. I mean, mm -hmm. we have to care for our caregivers and uh, we also have to be able to provide resources for students like we normally would. I know that we have social emotional, um, uh, we're looking at the social emotional needs of our students on a regular basis and that we certainly would need to during this period as well. Um, well, there's a lot of, um, I can tell you from looking at the, the email, there's a lot of go going on at the building level. Mm -hmm. um, we've sent, Mr. Spiegel sent out, um, he can talk about it, the, how, do, how you would access um, resources if you were to need that. We have, mm -hmm. we're looking into another provider to give some um, mental health support in situations because right now AYCC has a wait list of about a month. Mm -hmm. uh, and the director of nursing and I have been looking at a possible um, provider, but th these are all things that take time to sort of ramp up. Um, mm -hmm. I think in terms of individual teachers, I think that's happening more at the building level in terms mm -hmm. of definite outreach and bringing into meetings and talking. Certainly I'm pushing out messages, but that's not quite the same thing as mm -hmm. you know, reaching out. We are concerned and there's been actually a fair amount of conversation about, you know, for, for the effect of this on anxiety and just mental health and, and the effect on that with health is, is how we are going to um, support those students in particular. That's really more the conversations than about who who may be experiencing a very difficult time right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, there there are have been and there will continue to be outreaches in that regard. Yeah, please communicate with the staff that the full committee I know is, is grateful for their work and cares about them in that uh, we're partners with them and we hope that they, they come through this uh, healthy and, 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 and well at the end. Yeah. One of the things that's been interesting in our meetings when people are at home, some people have young children and you know they're home with their children too mm -hmm. as they're trying to navigate their learning and stay professionally connected. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not, an uncommon situation for many of our teachers who are young and have young families. And so mm -hmm. it, it's, I know they're experiencing a lot of stress in that. And we'll say, could you mute? <laughs> because, mm -hmm. you know, they've got the, the children. And um, so I think everybody is being stressed, but the willingness, what, what is very hopeful about all of this is it's bringing out some of the best in people too, in terms of yeah. the caring and compassion that people are showing. Thank you. Can I add? 
that. Um, so uh, Kathy uh, referenced the employee assistance uh, programs we offer um, through the, the whole town. So any town employee um, has a couple different options. We've had um, uh, employee assistance through All One Health for many years. Um, and then we also, the GIC, our health insurance uh, provider offers their uh, another employee assistance uh, program. So our employees have access to both of those for different employee uh, assistance resources. And the GIC one has an, a devoted line for coronavirus. So mm -hmm. people who are concerned about it, have, have uh, anxiety about it or other reasons, they can call that line. And I did send out an email to our entire staff today about that. Um, and I know that our um, director of uh, school counseling and social emotional um, learning, Sarah Bird, has been very active with um, her department to make sure that they are uh, providing the resources they need for students and staff. I know our, our school counselors and social workers are working with the students, uh, outreach students in their buildings and sending emails to staff about resources they can, ha they can, um, they can access as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Again, thank you. Thanks. All right. Now, Ms. Morgan, now, you're, now it's your turn. Hi. Um, so thank you. And, uh, you know, I've been thinking as we've been sitting here talking, you know, Dr. Bodhi, you started tonight talking about this sort of philosophy and this vision around how we were going to move through these weeks of school closure. And, you know, I've had the experience of being a parent of, you know, four children, one very young, a middle school student, two fifth graders. Um, and, you know, my feeling has been over the last two weeks that but, you know, the reality of it is, is that you need us parents more than you've ever needed us before. This school district needs these parents. We now have thousands and thousands, and I don't want to call us employees because we're not being paid, and we're certainly not educators because we're not very good at this, um, but we are having to implement what, you know, what the, what our teachers and our you know, curriculum leaders and what the, you know, the highest levels of our, you know, of our administration want to have happen. And, you know, I think that this is a district that really does a good job generally of communicating with its staff and with the, you know, the people who work, um, who work under you and, and through you. Um, but, you know, I think that we, we need to provide more to parents and to families because we now are not dropping our kids off and picking them up and making sure that they brought their lunch or not. In my case, um, we're, we're, we're doing this, we're doing this work. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of information The the FAQs are, are excellent. Um, and, and they're, you know, they're really a good start. Um, but I, you know, as we move into next week, when there are going to be different expectations and, and it may be harder, frankly, for parents to meet those expectations. Um, I hope that, that, you know, we, um, I, I, I've always had this sense that we're kind of kept a little bit at arm's length, you know, that we're sort of just, you know, just like, just wait, just wait, just wait. And I think um, that, that we've done that. And, and I, and, but I also think that we need to acknowledge that in this situation, we are playing this absolutely critical role in the education of these kids and um and and that were really really necessary and um so i'm looking forward to moving through you know this two week period and then into the next period to you know to see how you know we're all going to work together to be able to do that um i have a couple of really specific one one specific thing that came up tonight was that um you were talking about the use of google classroom which i think is fantastic um i have a middle school daughter it's great Great. It's easy to use. She's basically independent on that. Um, fifth graders do not have email. Um, they can log into Google Classroom, but they do not receive emails. I have two fifth graders. I tried to log into their email account when we were on the meeting tonight, and they don't have access to email. So um, Google Classroom is a lot easier to use if students can actually receive email notifications it. about what's on it. Hopefully that's something we can get turned on. I fully support fifth graders, fourth graders, and third graders not having had email up until now. Seems like a good idea. Um, 
fully support that. Um, but I think if we're going to be expecting them to engage with Google Classroom, we, they need to have some way of being notified that something has been posted. Um, the, um, I'm assuming that the family FAQ will be updated after you email or as part of the communication to families tomorrow. Is that true? Yes, that's correct. Great. Okay, and then will um, information like uh, Mr. Saunders' question, and I've have had this dozens of times, um, you know, really clear communication about the use of either Google, Google uh, Zoom or Hangouts. Is can we provide that? You know, the FAQ seems like a great spot for it. It's really easy to navigate. Um, just I've I've seen so many different emails from different teachers, from different parents that have conflicting information about this. I think that's reasonable. It's been it's only been two weeks, <laughs> um, but I'm hoping that you know something can be written and vetted. And and you know again, we're the people on the ground who are who are implementing this. Like I I am for my seven year old. He can't he can't zoom. <laughs> he maybe will be by the end of this. But um, we really need to have that information too. And it seems like it's gone out to faculty, but it's it it has to get to us more quickly because of the nature of the relationship that we have with the kids right now. Um, and then the really the question that I had asked over email that I didn't hear was, um, is there a plan to, so this is actually my only question that I need an answer to, or even a, I don't know what the answer is, um, is whether, when medication will be available to students if they want to pick that up, or has that already been done? That was done. It was okay. done the Friday the 13th, actually. Um, uh, the um, But if there's somebody has medication that they did not pick up, they can notify our the, the school principal and our director of nursing, and we can we can uh, make sure that happens. But no, that was an offer out there. Could you maybe include that in the FAQ? Just that if they have medication, medication, they yeah. Want, just this is the kind of time when people who have you know inhalers. Maybe they didn't realize on Friday that they wanted it. So I, I've heard from a couple of people with questions about it. So hopefully they've already solved those issues, but it would be nice to have one. The, the FAQ is, is great and um, is really easy to navigate. So it seems like a really good repository for this kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I think it is too. It's, uh, yeah, we've, we've had some even kudos on it from outside the district too. And it does, and then we'll just keep updating it and and probably and highlight things that are new so people aren't going through it all the time too. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so a lot of my questions and concerns have been covered, um, but I, I just want to go back to communication and structure. Um, and I think everybody understands that this was sudden and unexpected and things are evolving. Um, they may be evolving more quickly here than other districts. Clearly there are other districts that are also evolving more quickly than us. Um, uh, I think we're probably in the middle, which is okay, um, as long as we continue to evolve. Um, so the, the, the two things that I think parents are looking for is, is structure and, and communication. So, um, uh, it, it sounds like, and I, and I did see an F, a staff FAQ that I went out today, it sounds like teachers are now going to be giving assignments, which is good. That's definitely something that the parents want. Uh, it sounds like for now, it's just once a week uh, as a minimum. That mm -hmm. doesn't seem consistent with the new guidelines from the state. So maybe that's something we can evolve as we go forward. But I think, but I think what we need is a, is a plan, a remote learning plan um, uh, I, you know, I, I don't think an FAQ structure is going to get us all the way there. Um, there should be FAQs like about why aren't we doing virtual classrooms or, or why can't we, why can't we advance the curriculum? Why can't we do this? There definitely are some FAQs that need to be answered, but the basic structure of what we're doing as a district in the next week and then in the week after that as it evolves and, and changes, um, should be in some sort of, you know, two or three paragraph document, um, like what was contained within the, Le the Lexington letter, what Waltham has put out, um, what other towns have been doing. Um, just so parents can know that either maybe it's, tw maybe it's just once a week for now, but for next week, it's just once a week. 
Maybe after that, it'll be two or three times a week, their students can be expecting assignments from their teacher, which they're expected to turn in, will not be graded, but will be corrected. Um, and so I think that kind of cadence and that kind of clear structure is what people are looking for. And it should be you know, communicated to teachers and to parents so that everybody's on the same page about what's happening. Mm -hmm. So I know you're putting out you know, an, an email tomorrow and that will have some of this content. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's unclear to me. I mean, the, the state guidance says we have to develop a remote learning plan. Doesn't say we have to you know, submit that to the state or anything, but um, mm -hmm. uh, and a program, it doesn't actually say written plan. So, um, yeah. so maybe it's not required, but I, I do think that a written remote learning plan, again, doesn't have to be a multi-page document, just a three or four step uh, three or four step thing um, would be very helpful to get everybody on the same page. And I hope we can work towards that. Uh, so that's sort of my suggestion. And, and uh, um, as we go forward, uh, I guess we'll go around for, for another set of questions because I see Bill is raising his hand. Mr. Hayner, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, one of my concerns, uh, I've, I've been following along with Desi and everything. They keep using the word recommend. Uh, they have the power to, to enforce. This is unusual and I appreciate it. The problem is one, the state recommends, one community gets very active, has a lot of technology, does a lot of things and things start going and my neighbor talks to another neighbor in another town. There needs to be consistency, uh, easy to say from sitting here on a school committee, hard to do as a superintendent, hard to do as a, a state, hard to do as a nation. Um, Parents just need to know that we're trying to do all this. I agree with everything everyone has said before. We need consistency. The state also needs to develop some consistency and said they have yet to make a decision whether they're going to require MCAS or not. They have, uh, I, I, I worry about seniors that have not passed it. Mm -hmm. uh, if the state turns around and doesn't require it, do the universities and colleges accept it? Uh, what happens? We are in limbo. And uh, I just want to thank you all, all the support staff for doing what they've done. Thank you. All right, um, since we're going around again, Dr. Allison Ampey, anything? Um, I was wondering if, uh, I don't actually know how many homeless students there are in our district. And I realize now that's, I should know this, but I'm wondering if we have any and if how we're making provisions for ensuring continuing education for them. We are too. And th this is a concern is how we're going to, to do that. Um, and in some cases, we're going to have to reach out individually if they're in DCF care. Um, and um, that's it's, it's done on an individual basis. But this is, I have to say, this situation we're in isn't ideal, obviously. It's, it's just unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And trying to figure out how to reach all the kids that normally would just come into our school buildings and we have all the, the people, the supports the, that are there and trying to, uh, you know, support them in their mental health, emotional, social, academic, it is challenging when and you start to realize really how special schools are that people come to them because it's really difficult to provide everything that students need in this kind of situation. And it's not going to be perfect, but it doesn't mean we're not going to keep trying and, and trying to think about how we can do better and how we can reach more kids. Um, is there any, I guess when I, along with that, first, I'm glad that you're trying to reach these people individually. That's great. Um, I'm also concerned that this situation has the potential for increasing basically the achievement gap, but I'm not talking so much about uh, test results as the actual knowledge base and everything, mm -hmm. um, and that we don't want 
we're trying to minimize that and this situation has the potential for exacerb exacerbating it. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there's anything else we could be doing as a district, do we actually have additional staffing needs or, you know, as we figure out the next few weeks, um, because I, I'm with you, I'm concerned that it may well be beyond May 4th and, and that we need to be kind of thinking longer term and doing the mm -hmm. absolute best job we can. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else we need to be setting up to make things as best as possible, especially for our high needs students? Well, that's certainly been a focus. Um, there's been many things being looked at. Um, we, one thing, just the example I gave earlier, where we're, we're asking special education teachers to work with teachers together on assignments to begin, and so the accommodations are part of it, not not after the fact. Little things like that, but um, we are also concerned that this could could exacerbate the achievement gap because. Um, some students who have resources and are also um, don't are, are are sort of very self motivated and will find different things that they interest them and have the resources to follow those interests could be in in contrast for students who do not and do not have the resources and uh, do not have the support to to continue deepening and learn deepening their learning. So all these things you said are absolutely correct. And, and all those things are being discussed and we're all trying to look at what ways we can uh, make a difference in that regard. But we are limited, we're limited in so many different ways. And, and um, certainly the, we're coming to see how important connections are digitally uh, for some of this. And uh, that is what we are looking at. And we've, we've given you know some stuff out at the elementary, but it's really hard to, we'll try to do some of that a little bit at the high school too uh, for students that need it. But uh, there's a lot of limitations in the situation we're in. There's no doubt about it. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry about that. I was on mute. Um, uh, Ms. Seuss, you're next. You're, you're on mute, sorry. Sorry, hi, I thought I'd done that. Um, just to reflect um, many things that Dr. Allison Ampe mentioned, um, you know, it's been a very fast and ever-changing and <laughs> changing mm -hmm. situation last couple of okay. weeks and that we expect more of the same. And mm -hmm. whereas a week ago, we were told we couldn't do new material, now it's allowed but not encouraged that very well at the, at the high school level, it very well in a couple of weeks might be encouraged. And so I just want us to think, to start planning for that. Mm -hmm. um, also to just to start planning for what next year is going to look like and how we can make sure that students who are, have not had access to the same resources for whatever reason, right? Um, can sort of join their peers and, and just sort of being very, mm -hmm thoughtful and creative about how that looks um, starting the fall. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I think we do have to plan for the possibility that students do not come back this year. Um, I'd love for everyone to get back together in May, but I think we just have to plan that that may not be possible. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Mr. Thielman. Um, so I think, uh, uh, you know, I think the whole world is grieving right now. I think this is an extraordinary uh, situation we're facing. And so uh, I, I want to thank the district and leadership for uh, working, uh, trying to find uh, as many solutions as possible to the situation we face. I would, um, you know, my my counsel would be, uh, for what it's worth, would be to uh, try to uh, try to document as much of what you're doing now and try to create uh, systems and strategies um, to move uh, to remote learning in the future. Because I, I think 
this may be the new normal. I think there may be, you know, I, I said to somebody, I think this is like the adult Columbine. People are experiencing uh, something they've never experienced before. And um, we're going to have to, as a society, um, get used to per moments where we're going to have to go uh, remote and use distance learning. And so, I don't know, I think this is, this, this is something that may happen more often uh, in the future in, 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 in our lives than we would like to think. Um, and so I just think it's important now to document everything you're experiencing, to think about uh, how can we do this next time, and then to think about how can we continue learning uh, in the future uh, when this sort of thing occurs. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I just think this, we, this may be the beginning of a new normal. We, you know, years ago in education, if you had told us we were going to have active shooter trainings, we thought you were crazy, right? Well, now we have that. So um, I don't know. I think it's something we just have to be prepared for and accept and um, document. So mm -hmm. no question. Let's just whatever my thinking. Thank you for all you're doing. And th thank the staff for all the time mm -hmm. and effort they're putting in. I think this is not an easy situation. It's not easy for parents, not easy for kids, not easy for educators, not easy for anybody. It's totally disrupting everything in our lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mr. Sukman, do you have anything else? You're, you're on mute. Yeah, I just want to concur that uh, I'm in awe with uh, the hard work that everybody's done to pull this together on short notice. Uh, keep on keeping on, and uh, we're here to support you and help us in any way we can. Ms. Morgan, anything else from you? All right. So the last thing for me is, is you know, we. It, it is frustrating, I think, to parents when, you know, they look at Weston and Cambridge and other districts that are taking a, that didn't sign that statement and are taking a, a, a bit of a different approach. Um, but I, I know we're not willing to do do that. But the one, the one item that did appeal to me is that they are taking the, the work that's being assigned for, for purposes of a participation type grade. Um, I don't know if there are gonna be any grades issued for fourth term if we don't go back anyways, but um, that might be something to consider. It does seem allowed by, by the new DESE guidelines. Um, and it may be, may be to motivate students to at least tell them, well, if you don't, if you don't turn anything in, then your teacher is gonna be calling you <laughs> to find out why you're not turning anything in. Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise I think it's still gonna be hard for parents to um, get their students to do anything for the next in the next four or five weeks. Um, so that's just something to consider. And thank you for all your work and your team. I know they're they're doing their best under very difficult circumstances. It's hard not being in the same room to discuss things. It's hard um, not having the same schedule. It's hard having your people's kids and families all in the house. So thank you all for all your hard work. Any last remarks, Dr. Bodie? No, you've all, you all, you've expressed a lot of things you know, that we are dealing with. It's uh, unprecedented time. It's just, what's happening is disruptive for all of us. And for some families, this is a very difficult time in terms of worry about loved ones too. And so that's a factor as well as anybody tries to focus on, you know, learning you know, something more about uh, long division. It, it, it does put our lives in a, in a different perspective as well as we go forward. But the one thing I, I would want to just conclude in saying is that uh, I think parents would be very um, heartened to hear how much teachers and administrators care about their children and are trying their very best to, um, to provide for them educationally as well as in other ways as, as well. Great. Thank you. All right. So the next item on our agenda is to um, staff the AEA negotiations subcommittee. Um, this is we had left. I had just uh, I left it open because I did not anticipate um, the start of negotiations until next year. Um, I still don't anticipate the need for a committee. Dr. Bodie has been working cooperatively with the union, um, but I did note that you know in Brookline they did have a formal 
MOU regarding um, activities during remote for remote learning. And I thought it would be good to form to staff the committee just just in case it's needed. So I asked Mr. Schlickman to serve and, and I, I thought I would serve as well. Um, and just a two person committee. I did not I did, do want to note that uh, Mr. Hayner also volunteered to serve. Um, but again, given the, the very short time frame and the hopefully unlikely need for the committee, um, my recommendation is a two person committee with myself and Mr. Schlickman. Um, so is there any uh, motion or discussion? Uh, so moved, I move the approval of the committee suggested by Chairman Cardin. Second. Great, thank you. Uh, is there any discussion? Um, I'm not gonna call names uh, for this, but just go ahead and uh, steal the floor if you have any anything to say. I think it's a good idea to have the committee set up and I think that's great. I'm glad you guys are willing to serve. Great. Thank you. All right. So we'll do a roll call vote if there's no further discussion. Okay. Mr. Hayner. Aye. Dr. Alice TMB. Aye. Ms. Seuss. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And myself. Yes, as well. Thank you. Um, and the next one is a uh, waiver of policy VDA. Um, basically, uh, I, not necessarily, we don't necessarily need to waive it. It's, I mean, I, I think legally speaking, our officers would continue to serve until new officers are elected, but it does say that our term is for one year. Um, so I just thought it would be, be belts and suspenders to waive the policy. So if I could get a motion to waive policy VDA until the new officers are elected. So move. I move to waive. Second. I second Bill's motion. Great. Thank you. Uh, is there any discussion? Go ahead, Mr. Hayner. I just think uh, Dr. Seuss ought to get an increase in salary for the remainder <laughs> of her tenure. Yes. <laughs> 20%. Right. We do have to do uh, any further discussion. Okay. We do have to, we are doing all votes by roll call. So, Mr. Hayner. Aye. Dr. Ellis Nampi. Yes. Ms. Seuss. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And I am also yes. A yes. Thank you again. All right. So is there anything else, Dr. Bodhi, that you would like to report on? The superintendent's report? Yes. Yeah. Well, as always, we have a, um, a high school building project update. All of that work continues. We had a building committee meeting on Tuesday. Uh, we had the experience of also doing this virtually. And so you, you learn a little bit about what works well and what, what doesn't work as well. Um, I think one of the things we discovered was length of meeting has an, is an issue uh, <laughs> as we do this. So the committee should be aware of, of the vote that the building committee did take on Tuesday night with regard to geothermal wells. We had a very robust uh, discussion. Um, a, a lot. There were four options, and even some of those options were broken into parts about what we could do. Because as you know, I reported the last time, in the practice field, which is the area behind Stop and Shop, that was going to be the site for most of the geothermal wells. When they got down into bedrock, down about close to 100 feet, they found um, some contaminant uh, and brought some of it up for checking. But we don't know what the spread of that is. There's just a lot of risk that will go on with continuing on that site. In fact, in all these different options, I won't go through all of them, as, but you know, I. I think the committee is certainly welcome as a public document to see what the options were, but the range was from about a million roughly to about 5 million of the different pop options that we could um, entertain. Continuing that site, going off into the softball field, you know, looking at the parking lot down off of uh, Millbrook, the, um, the area, uh, 
potentially in front of the school. Or, I mean, there was just, they looked at all of the different options and there were not only costs associated with all of them, there was, uh, there was delays on the project because if you, for example, uh, later on, you, you, these buildings were built for designed for geothermal, but now you have to change all the mechanicals on them to go to a different option. So all in all, after much discussion and much looking at this, the committee has decided uh, to not go with geothermal wells as an option for um, part of the, the HVAC system. But the committee is still committed to an all electric building and also perhaps the increase of uh, energy from photovoltaic cells. And then on a motion actually by Dr. Alton Ampey, we're gonna be taking a look at, you know, if we do have some savings, what would that um, look like? And maybe some things were on the BE list that could come back. That's all very um, indefinite at this point. But uh, the, the, the issue in front of us, given this particular uh, crisis that we find ourselves in, you know, it's really hard to see what's going to happen. Somerville, I believe, has stopped construction. And as soon as you have a disruption in the cycle, we, it, it's just an unknown at this point. Um, but that was a decision that the committee made. Um, not happily, I might add, but a lot of us were, um, in fact, the whole committee was very, very committed to wanting to have this happen. But there's just so many reasons why it's just not going to work on this site. It's a tight site. We're trying to do so much on this site and it's just too tight to do everything we want. So I just wanted to let you know that was was happening. I think Mr. Cardin, you were on, you were at least on the, the list of people around the watching the meeting. Yeah, I was, on, I was on for a little while to see how the, uh, the uh, Zoom meeting was going to work. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, just if I could add one thing, Lynn, how do I raise my yeah, Of course. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. So um, uh, Kathy summed up perfectly exactly what we did the other night. Um, and I also was conscious that at about this time, because I was running the meeting about 8.15, I started getting texts from a, several members of the committee telling me to try to move it along. So um, <clears throat> I, uh, so we'll, I, I'm conscious of that. Uh, the, uh, the one thing I want to add is that right now work is taking place. So the Parmenter School renovation project is going forward. We have uh, 10 to 14 workers on site now. And um, we are planning in mid-April to have workers on the on the front of the building, obviously all doing some of the pre-work, pre-site work to begin the excavation and the foundation work, which is supposed to take place in June. Um, but obviously, you know, we're in unknown territory and we don't know if everything will continue as scheduled right now. Mm -hmm. Is that about, Kathy, is about, yeah. That's, no, we that's correct. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Is there any questions from the committee? Bill, you had your hand raised, but I don't think you really meant to raise your hand. <laughs> no, okay. No problem. Uh, Sorry. Okay, no problem. Uh, all right. So consent agenda. Um, so I am pulling out the public hearing until we um, I consult with town council on uh, how the procedure for holding a remote public hearing, which might be different. Um, so I'm removing that from the consent agenda. The other items are considered routine and will be enacted by one motion. There'll be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence, approval of warrant number 2032, dated 3-17-2020 in the amount of 691-639.92. Move to approve as amended. Is there a second? Second. All right. Roll call, Mr. Hayner. Aye. Dr. Allison Ampey. Aye. Ms. Seuss. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And I am also yes. Motion approved, thank you. Uh, I will quickly go through the 
subcommittees. I'm not sure there's been much activity. Budget? Um, budget doesn't have anything to report, but I do have a question. I don't understand under these circumstances, um, are we supposed to continue, continue trying to do business as usual, or are we only supposed to be doing kind of emergency business? And specifically, I'm thinking about the athletic fees stuff. Um, do we try and figure out how to make that move forward, or do I just table that for now? Uh, so, uh, there, the original guidance was to, you know, to suspend, cancel all meetings because we would, would not be able to have a quorum. Now that we can do remote meetings, um, that guidance was never rescinded, but um, uh, I think important business can be continued, is my sense. Um, I don't know that that falls under important business, but I don't know how other how the rest of the committee feels. Ms. Seuss? Oh, um, yeah, I, I think that it makes sense to pause that, especially since we wouldn't do anything without a pretty robust outreach to the community, which is just much more difficult to do at this point. So my gut says that that should probably be on hold. I would agree. That was also my sense. I just wanted to bring it up. Mm -hmm. um, since it is something that we were, we had talked about and is, you know, I should be working on that right now. Um, so, okay, nothing more to yeah. report. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think other than, than required business, um, it probably makes sense to suspend what we can suspend, uh, including that. Okay, uh, nothing else from budget? Uh, community relations. Thing. CIAA? Nothing. Thing. Facilities, Mr. Hayes? Nothing. Hayer. Policies and procedures? Anything? Nothing. Um, uh, we did the building committee, calendar committee, election modernization. That's it. Any liaison or reports or announcements? Mr. Hayner? Uh, under announcements, I'm sorry to report uh, two of the uh, student. Marktown meetings have been canceled, and uh, it's unlikely that the other two will participate. Um, I'm sure they're going to be disappointed too. Can I have two announcements also, if I could? Uh, one has to do with um, um, our distribution of lunch program. We have decided. I actually, I, I have no role in this. Um, the Arlington Eats and our food service are evolving the program differently uh, from their experience this week that we can see that um, some families need actually more food than what was being given at the lunchtime. So uh, it's changing tomorrow, I think is the last day to grab and go and it's, it's evolving into another way to distribute food. And I do uh, want to mention this phone number. I don't have anybody be listening that would uh, this would be helpful but if you had the number and you knew somebody or could call for them that would be terrific so for the Arlington food hotline the number is 781-316-3400 that's 316-3400 and you can you can just say what the need is how many people in the family locations and, and uh, bigger bags of food are going to be um, provided. The second announcement is that I believe we're going to go ahead with finance committee on Monday night. At least that's the plan right now, um, doing a virtual meeting. I'm not quite sure how that's going to play itself out uh, in terms of documents or presentations. So um, Mr. Mason and I are in communication about that issue, but. Uh, I'll send you any of the links to the virtual meeting to that still go forward. All right, great. Any other announcements, Mr. Thielman? Uh, you know, I don't have an announcement. I just have a question. I mean, first of all, Len, this may or may not be your last meeting. So uh, I think it's, you're going to keep chairing the meetings and we're going to meet on, on Thursday, that next, the 9th, correct? 
Uh, so yeah, so I plan to keep our scheduled meetings. Um, and okay, good. Uh, there is, if there is no need for them, as we get, you know, within the two day window, um, then, uh, then I can, I can cancel them. I think, uh, however, uh, at least a brief check in every two weeks is probably going to be required. Yeah. Just, so just I would, cover, I would say but just okay. to cover the evolving updates. Yeah. I would say one is we should meet on Thursday the 9th. And secondly, I want to, you know, usually at the last meeting of the year, which was going to be tonight, which isn't tonight, we thank the chair for his work, for her work over the course of the year. So on behalf of all the committee, I want to thank you for being a great chair, doing a great job, treating all of us equally and fairly. And uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, so, yeah. And get to enjoy your chair for, two more months, for, so. <laughs> for, two, for who knows, yeah, until two, two months. Until maybe, Two months, yeah. So we get to stick with you. So okay, so we are going to meet on the ninth. Thank you. I want a clarification. Great, thanks. Great. Anything else? All right. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. Thank you. Uh, and roll call, Mr. Hayner. Yes. Dr. Alice Nampi. Yes. Okay. Uh, Miss Seuss. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And I'm also yes. So this, I uh, if I may, that's the first time in the history of this committee we've all given the same answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. meeting, Len. Good job. Thank you, all, Len. Be all safe, right. everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Be safe and sane. Yes, everybody stay well. safe. Stay safe and sane. Yeah, I like that. Take care.